Thank you very much, colleagues. Good morning. And uh, uh, before we start, our first item of business today is a consideration of business motion 21233 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Bureau, <coughs> on behalf of the Bureau setting up a revision to today's business. Mr Day. Uh, President Officer, uh, my apologies to the Chamber for having to propose a change to today's business at such short notice, but the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport is required to participate in a meeting with the UK Government regarding the coronavirus and is therefore going to be unable to update the Chamber on this today. However, the First Minister will write to all party leaders as soon as is practically possible to update them after this meeting and with the agreement of the Bureau, the Government proposes to make a statement to the Chamber on this issue next Tuesday. Uh, thank you very much to Mr Day. Uh, this information has been circulated to business managers um, by email this morning and by discussion, um, so we are accepting the motion. However, there is a huge parliamentary demand for an update on the statement. I think everyone understands this is a moving situation. The Health Minister and the First Minister will need to attend the COBRA meeting. However, there is an expectation, I think, that Parliament will be kept fully informed. Can I suggest that, although I'm chairing a meeting of the corporate body at lunchtime, that uh, Mr Day and the business managers get together with the business team at lunchtime uh, to discuss how Parliament might be kept informed. In the light of all the responses and the questions that come at First Minister's questions, I think we can revisit this question. There might be an opportunity to, to perhaps have an urgent question at the end of the day. Um, but perhaps if we can get the business managers together at lunchtime, uh, we'll discuss this matter. But on that note, uh, can I propose um, that motion 21233 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much, colleagues. We're going to turn now to general questions. A first question from Tom Arthur. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to tackle adverse childhood experiences in the Renfrewshire South constituency. Minister Marie Todd. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government recognises and is committed to tackling adverse childhood experiences or ACEs both within the Renfrewshire South constituency and across Scotland. This is a broad agenda which we are progressing across many ministerial portfolios pursuing four key areas for actions as set out in our programme for government. We are one, providing intergenerational support for parents, families and children. Two, reducing the negative impact of ACEs for children and young people. Three, developing adversity and trauma-informed workforce and services. And four, increasing societal awareness and supporting action across communities. Tom Arthur. Can I thank the Minister for that answer and welcome the work that the Scottish Government is doing. She made reference to working across portfolios. Um, one organisation op operating within my constituency is called Youth Interventions. They're based in Linwood and they do very important work addressing, uh, addressing issues of adolescent substance misuse and also the experiences of young people growing up in households where there would be substance misuse. Can I ask the Minister to join me in commending the work of Youth Interventions and would she accept my invitation to come to Linwood and Renfrewshire South to see their work firsthand? Minister. Absolutely. I welcome the valuable work that youth interventions carry out in Renfrewshire, supporting young people who are affected by alcohol and drug use. Addressing the impact that alcohol and drug use can have on individuals and their families is absolutely critical to preventing adverse childhood experiences from occurring, safeguarding future generations. I'd be more than happy to consider a vis visit to youth interventions and would ask Mr Arthur to contact my office directly with further details. Thank you very much. Question number two, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government what impact changes to the pension age and new rules for mixed age couples might have on discretionary housing payments in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell. Thank you. I'm deeply concerned these damaging UK government policies will punish older people. We estimate that this could change could lead to an annual loss of as much as £7,000 per household and by 2023-24 could affect as many as 5,600 households in Scotland. The effect of these changes impact on entitlement to assistance such as cold weather payments and also increase the number of households impacted by the bedroom tax, therefore increasing demand for discretionary housing payments which we use to mitigate the bedroom tax in full. The Scottish Fiscal Commission forecast this unwelcome change for mixed age couples will cost an additional £3 million in 2020 21. Bob Doris. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, I'm glad that the Scottish Government has estimated how much this double whammy will cost from the new government, that double whammy being removing financial support to pension households and requiring the Scottish Government to pick up the pieces in 2020 2021. 
Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to make representation to the UK Government to actually reverse these policies or financially recompense the Scottish Parliament? Secretary. As the member knows, we have urged the UK Government on uh, a number of occasions to reverse, reverse their damaging welfare cuts and will continue to do so. The action we are taking to tackle poverty and inequality is clearly reflected in the budget for 2021. That includes investment to mitigate the worst impacts of UK Government welfare cuts, including the bedroom tax of £110 million. That includes an increase of £3 million following the Scottish Fiscal Commission modelling of the increase in pension credit, qualifying age and the UK Government's changes to benefits for mixed age couples. So that's £110 million that we would much rather spend on other priorities, including uh, tackling child poverty. It's a pity that we have to continue to mitigate these actions of the UK Government. Question number three, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that people across the country have easy access to community sports facilities. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. The Scottish Government is committed to ensuring everyone across Scotland has access to sporting facilities within their local community. Sports Scotland are on track to achieve our commitment of delivering 200 community sports hubs across the country in, in 2020. And as members will know, community sports hubs focus on sustainable community-led approaches that get clubs and local partners working together to develop welcoming, safe and fun environments for sport that meets local needs. Brian Whittle. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, community sports assets across the country have been an easy target for council cuts, especially in rural and the more deprived areas, uh, as they get their budgets continually squeezed. So does the Minister agree with me that by cutting access to activity, it is a false economy because if the spend on the preventive agenda is cut, it will just appear in the ledger further down the line in poor health outcomes. And if so, what will the Scottish Government do to reverse this trend? Cabinet uh, Minister. So the, the member will be uh, well aware that uh, local authorities uh, across Scotland have had their budgets supported in a way that we have not seen elsewhere on these islands. Um, and, and, and that has allowed um, local uh, decision makers to look at a range of priorities and we are now seeing more people involved in a range of sporting activities across Scotland. Clearly Mr. Mr. Whittle comes to the Chamber often expecting the Scottish Government to centrally direct local decision makers in a way which it surprises me but because, because I, I thought we all thought that that localism was important, that, that, that council decisions should be made by local councils and not by me as the Minister for Sport. I think we, we need to work together, we need to support local authorities where they are supporting um, sporting and other physical activities. There's some fantastic work going on across Scotland and I would always encourage local authorities to work with a range of partners to make sure the offer in their area continues to improve and more people become more active everywhere in Scotland. Question number four, Rhoda Grant. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had regarding the proposed privatisation of the new merged college in Shetland. Minister Richard Lockett. The Scottish Government is in regular contact with the Scottish Funding Council on this issue, but we have not yet received any formal business case for a merger. We expect this will be submitted in due course, at which point it will undergo full scrutiny. Rhoda Grant. I have had concerns expressed to me about the level of consultation with staff, students and the wider public. Concerns were also expressed around access to public funds for further and higher education and the impact of privatisation on staff's terms and conditions. Can the, the Minister advise me what protections would be available in the event of privatisation to allay these fears and whether they would block privatisation should it carry such risks? Minister. Well, clearly this is a proposal that's been developed locally and we await a final business case to be signed off by the Scottish Funding Council, then which the Scottish Government will be consulted upon before any prior legislation is put in place to, to make the merger uh, officially happen. Uh, in terms of the funding, again, that's a case of the financial memorandum that would have to be signed and uh, put together for the new merger. If that was to proceed, it would then be signed off by the Scottish Funding Council as well. So there are processes in place to make sure all these issues are in order. If the member has specific concerns, uh, she should by all means write to me and I'll have them looked at. Thank you very much. Question number five, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to reduce the disability employment gap. Minister Jamie Hepburn. 
The Scottish Government is committed to at least having the disability employment gap in Scotland by 2038. A disability employment action plan was launched in December 2018 and will shortly publish a first progress report. In the action plan, the baseline disability employment gap was 37.4 per cent. In the latest statistics covering the period October 2018 to September 2019, the disability employment gap was 33.9 per cent. Progress in taking forward the action plan to date includes publishing a recruitment retention plan, establishing a public social partnership to help support employers to recruit and train disabled people, and delivering personalised support to 19,000 people through Fair Start Scotland, with 5,000 already supported into work. James Dornan. Thank the Minister for that answer. But I've recently met with several of my constituents who have extensive physical disabilities. They found it extremely difficult to find, and then when they do find, to hold down permanent work. What particular actions within the Fairer Scotland for Disabled People Employment Action Plan will help my constituents secure long term employment? Minister. Well, of course, the Disability Employment Action Plan is a pan disability one, but I, I do recognise that some groups can be disproportionately impacted and may require more target support to find and sustain uh, employment. I've obviously set out my initial answer, some of the progress that we have made, which will support the very constituents that James Dornan has laid uh, out as uh, a particular source of concern for him, such as the uh, recruitment retention plan, uh, such as the public social partnership that I've referred to. Of course, we're also taking forward an accessible travel framework, which will remove uh, barriers uh, for which prevent people from being able to travel. We're establishing the Parental Employability Support Fund with a, a focus on disabled uh, parents in particular. Uh, we continue to, of course, take forward Fair Start Scotland, which is supporting many disabled people. And we have our £800,000 Workplace Equality Fund supporting employers to adopt fair and inclusive workplace uh, practices, which has supported uh, many uh, disability-related issues. So that's some of the work underway. There's much more to be done, but Mr Donnan can be assured that we'll continue to take forward that work. Question number six, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Scottish Fiscal Commission's forecast that spending on devolved employability services will be £27 million lower in 2022 23 Minister Jamie Hepburn. The First Start Scotland was commissioned for a three year referral period ending in March 2021, with a further two years for people to benefit from the nature of the support offered. The forecast figures reflect the natural tailing off of that contract. The latest statistics show that over 19,000 people have started in the service with over 5,000 people supported into work in a dignified and respectful way. Mark Griffin. I note the Minister's answer adds to a series of written responses that reveal that Remploy is no longer active in Glasgow, the third sector no longer supports the scheme in Tayside, Rathbone and Wise have left the South West and even NHS Forth Valley have pulled out in my own region. On top of the Scottish Fiscal Commission forecasting that spend will be £4 million lower this year than what it said 18 months ago, FOIs reveal all of the contracts are under performance management after hundreds of compliance issues have been identified. By all, by all accounts, Minister, this scheme is in crisis. Fair Start Scotland was meant to get disabled people into work, and yet we're over halfway through and 10% of referrals have made it into a job for three months or more. Can the Minister see how the Scottish Government will turn Fair, Sc Fair Start Scotland around? Minister. Well, frankly, I find that a, a fairly extraordinary question because there's not one word of welcome from Mr Griffin that since the, life to, uh, the beginning of this initiative, 19,000 people, that's 19,000 people, the length and breadth of this country have been supported through the service, 5,000 of them now into employment in that dignified and person-centred fashion that we sought to take forward, none of them under the threat of sanction as existed under the previous initiative that was in place under the UK government's hands. In terms of his suggestion that this is not a successful initiative, I utterly reject the premise of that question. If we look at the first year of the operation of the programme, we are supporting the equivalent of 9% of the unemployed population in Scotland. The programme that is in existence in England and Wales, which presumably would have operated in Scotland if it hadn't been devolved, we took a different approach, is supporting only 4% of the unemployed population in those countries. So the notion that this is not a programme that is delivering for the people of Scotland is one I totally and utterly reject. Colin Beattie. The Scottish Government has taken a substantially different approach to employability services than that of the UK Government, and that's most notably in terms of participation being voluntary. 
Can the Minister advise how the reach of devolved employability services compares to that of UK government programmes? Minister. Well, of course, the most fundamental way it differs is the way I've just laid out to Mr Griffin. Unlike the approach taken by the UK government, we do not um, uh, compel people to take part in our programmes under the threat of being sanctioned uh, under the social security system, which we have heard has uh, delivered many people into uh, serious uh, circumstances of further deprivation. I've already laid out the fact that we're supporting a wider cohort of the unemployed population. If you look at the unemployed disabled population in a particular, if you look at Work Choice, which was operated by the DWP in its last year of operation in Scotland, that supported 12% of unemployed disabled population in Scotland. Whereas in the first year of Fair Start Scotland, we supported 90% of the same population. And in the uh, analysis of the first year of the operation of our programme, of the 1,000 participants surveyed, over 90% of them said they were being treated in a dignified and respectful manner. That's the approach that I can uh, continue to take with our employability services. Yes, there's much to learn from, but we are delivering for the people of Scotland. Question number seven, John Mason. Hey, thank you very much. Hey, to ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that the action it takes to restrict hate speech does not inadvertently discourage freedom of speech. Cabinet Secretary Aileen Kemp. Thank you. Scotland is a modern, inclusive nation which protects, respects and realises internationally recognised human rights. Any form of hate crime is nonetheless unacceptable. In June 2017, the Scottish Government published an ambitious programme of work to tackle hate crime through an action group that I chaired. Our plans include the introduction of a hate crime bill during this parliamentary period. This bill, like all of our efforts to tackle hate crime, has been carefully balanced against the fundamental rights and freedoms of all who live in Scotland, as reflected in human rights legislation. John Mason. I yeah, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. We've had two recent cases in Glasgow where freedom of speech apparently has been restricted. One uh, when Franklin Graham was refused uh, an event at the SEC, and the other one where four women Scott were refused an event at the Glasgow Women's Library. It appears that there is a cooling towards freedom of speech, and when someone disagrees with someone else, it's just called hate speech. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm aware of the exchanges that the member uh, refers to, and I'm sure that we are all aware of the tone and nature of some of the discussion and dialogue that's gone along with that as well. That tone, I don't think, is necessarily helpful in terms of carrying, uh, carving out the space for dialogue, discussion and debate, and for that to be done respectfully. And as I said in my earlier reply, Scotland is a modern and inclusive nation, but that does not happen by accident and is precious, and we need to work hard to keep that. That's incumbent on all of us as parliamentarians to ensure that we set the right tone and that we lead by example, and we are guided by kindness, respect and empathy, and that should be the hallmark of our approach in all of these vexing and challenging discussions that we have. And Gordon Lindhurst. <clears throat> Following on from the Cabinet Secretary's comments, does she share the concern of many Christians in Edinburgh at the cancellation of a Destiny Church event at the public Usher Hall venue and their concern about perceived uh, potentially state-supported religious censorship? Cabinet Secretary. Again, as I said, you know, I think uh, some of the discussion and dialogue that happens uh, around that, sometimes the tone of that is not necessarily helpful. I'm happy to meet with the, the member, I'm happy to meet with John Mason as well, should they have uh, concerns to make sure that as we take forward the, the hate crime bill, that some of those uh, concerns can be, uh, you can be made uh, and feel reassured. Scotland is a modern inclusive nation, as I said, but it has to be worked hard for. So again, I think we should lead by example. We can meet with you and to discuss some of those concerns so that we can make sure that we can proceed on a positive way so that people don't feel uh, in any way threatened. Question number eight, Polly McNeill. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reported concerns regarding the morale at Glasgow School of Art. Minister Richard Lockett. The Scottish Funding Council continues to meet with the Glasgow School of Art senior management on a regular basis to ensure the high level of governance we expect of our higher education institutions is delivered and to support staff and students. Pauline McNeill. The Minister will be aware that a staggering £800,000 was paid out accompanied by confidentiality agreements at the School of Art. These kind of gagging orders are concerning because they have important information about the running of the Glasgow School of Art, but in contrast, whistleblower Gordon Gibb was sacked for speaking out on his view of the running of Glasgow School of Art. This is a school which gets funding from the Funding Council. When will the Minister start asking the institution to account for this unacceptable sacking of a whistleblower and presiding over dreadful relations at a critical time, or is he not concerned about that? 
Minister. As I explained to the member just a few moments ago and have done in our previous questions, the Scottish Funding Council have looked at all the procedures followed by uh, the Glasgow School of Arts and took the view they were followed correctly. Uh, however, we do know that, that there are now five new members of the Glasgow School of Arts board, as well as the recent appointment of Penny Macbeth as its new director as well. So I hope the member uses the opportunity to meet the new members of the board and the new director and discuss her concerns with them. And indeed, I look forward to meeting them as well. And on that note, I'm pleased to say that the school was named eighth in the world for delivering art and design courses in the latest QS World University rankings that were published only last week, and we should all welcome that as well.